Emike Adeyemi. I am the executive director of Faith Foundation. Uh, Faith Foundation is a 20 year old nonprofit uh, supporting entrepreneurs in Nigeria, aspiring and emerging entrepreneurs. And we do that through a variety of ways. Uh, we, do, we have two incubator or incubator and accelerator programs that we've run over the last 20 years. And uh, over the last five years, we've also been doing quite a lot of work around the research and uh, policy advocacy space. And it's on that last part that we are doing this session. Um, this is actually a, an exciting and an initial uh, first time we're doing a policy workshop um, of its kind. Uh, we've done our policy dialogue now for about five years, uh, but those usually are high level uh, policy conversations that we have. And um, last year, when we had a conversation really around supporting businesses to scale, uh, we had quite a lot of practical questions asking how. Um, how do we do this? How do we do that? So one of the things we decided to add for our policy dialogue for this year was to bring in um, a workshop part to it so that those of us who are doing different things in the space can get a better hands-on perspective in terms of the work that we do, and it can be much more interactive and much more learning and sharing. Um, earlier this morning, we had our policy dialogue series on mapping Nigeria's entrepreneurship ecosystem. And we had quite a few people in the space who were sharing work that they have done locally or internationally in terms of mapping entrepreneurship ecosystems. But we, and we also spoke a lot around issues around data, policy, aggregating information, uh, and, and also providing information and insights into uh, different ecosystems. And so the second part today is what we are all having here, which we're all very happy that you've joined us. Um, because it's actually a small, we wanted it to be a session where we could engage very well. And we had over 190 people register for this session. I have to say that, even though we said that it was limited attendance. So we had a very difficult, um, work to now um, identify 40, about 30 to 40 people uh, for the conversations today, because part of the conversations was also ensuring that we had a diverse re representation of people who were doing different things, but also across different ge ge geographical spaces and locations. So just bring some sort of diversity so we didn't have the same type of people here. And I'm happy to see that we're all here and we're all um, in attendance here. So. My own job really is to introduce the conversations today. And I would also introduce our facilitators for today um, who have joined us. And then I'll hand over to our lead facilitator to take on the conversation. So once again, I'm Ademiki Adeyemi, and I'm very pleased and excited to welcome all of us here. So um, today, leading us on the workshop conversations today, uh, four, um, a four, in, a four persons who are in the very early parts of their morning times, uh, where they are, I know most of us on the part of the attendees of the workshop or the participants are uh, either in Nigeria, and I think there's one or two people on Europe time. So we're at least one or two o'clock on our side, but we're having uh, our facilitators who are from about six, five, six, seven a.m. their time. So first of all, we have to say thank you very much for waking up early and engaging us today. So. Our four facilitators today, are, the, uh, the first person I will introduce is somebody that is very dear to Faith Foundation for so many parts. Um, and his name is Ade Mabogunje. He's an engineering designer and scientist at the Center for Design Research at Stanford University. You're welcome, Dr. Ade. Um, our second facilitator is Niraj Sonalka, who is an inventor, learning experience designer and innovation ecosystems architect. You're welcome, Niraj. Thank you. Good to be here. Our third facilitator, thank you, it's good to have you too, is Greg Horowitz, who is the Managing Director at June Capital and Director for Innovation, Innovation Design at the University of California in San Diego. You're welcome, Greg. And uh, I'm very excited, last but definitely not the least, is Sherry Anderson, who is an international market research expert and consultant. You're welcome, Sherry. So I, I just briefly welcome and described everyone, but I'm going to now formally hand over to Dr. Ade to take on the formal introductions and I'll hand over the workshop to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, welcome, everyone. It's quite um, exciting to be here and to have this workshop. Um, let me, I'll share my screen and just... Um, Okay. So a few things. Let me give you a rough outline of what we're going to do today. Um, I'll begin with this very short introduction, and then Sherry will talk about values and lifestyle. And then um, Greg will talk about innovation ecosystem. And that, that's important because I'll show why that um, comes in. Um, we're looking at entrepreneurial ecosystem, but with a specific focus on innovation. And then after that, Niraj will um, lead us through an activity of a social contract activity, where you can think of a social contract as a map of an ecosystem. And then we will wrap up. Um, I want to um, I want to mention that in less than two hours, um, we can only give you an overview of ecosystem mapping. Um, please ask questions in the chat box. Um, questions that we cannot answer during the session will be answered afterwards and emailed to all attendees. Um, perhaps at this point, I will... Um... Okay, so I have a question for you, which I want you to type into your chat box. Um, is it necessary, and it's a policy question, is it necessary to cultivate elite entrepreneurs. Um, I say this in the sense of, um, we have many universities in Nigeria as an example. Is it important to earmark a few um, to give them um, specific focus and preferences? Um, so can you put your answers to that question, whether yes or no, in the chat box? I see three. I think we have more people. Okay, that's good. There's nobody saying no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Wally Any more? Should we have elite entrepreneurs? Is that an important thing from a policy perspective? Okay. Um, thanks for the, I can see we're training towards a yes, um, and that's very um, encouraging um, for us. But it's important to understand why elite and what benefits they will have for the system. So in general, I ask the question, why do we do a mapping? And um, we've been looking at innovation, and for us, a mapping is when you want to change the base rate of a community or a society and move it to a different base rate. Then you need to map what you have and then you need to map how you're going to get from the blue line to the red line so that you will have what we will call the baseline entrepreneurs and you'll have what you call your leading edge entrepreneurs. And your leading edge entrepreneurs um, are charting new territory. They will be part of even helping to map what the new territory looks like, in addition to, um, in addition to also creating the map for themselves. So I hope this idea of having the leading edge and the baseline uh, it becomes very important. Um, the facilitators today, we've all worked in different fields and we've been working together for a while. But I just want to mention a few things about the unique characteristics that they all bring. Um, for myself and Niraj, we've been looking at the mapping of high performance design teams. And um, this work has been sponsored um, by the National Science Foundation. And we've done a lot of work um, in and out of um, with different universities. For Greg, he's been working a lot on innovation ecosystem. Um, and, the, and he's the author of this book, The Rainforest, The Secret to Building the Next Silicon Valley. And you'll hear a bit about that. Sherry has been working on consumer segments. 
the principal scientist for VALS, Values and Lifestyles. And finally, the three of us, in particular um, Niraj, have been looking at the power law distribution of venture finance. Um, these are the four different components that you'll hear our conversations um, cut across. We won't go deeply into them, but you can already see that uh, for any entrepreneurial team, having a market or consumer that returns money is what makes, you know, anybody can start a business, but until you have the customers, then there's no business to be had. And the innovation ecosystem then becomes the playing field in which all this work goes. So I'm really very happy that um, both um, Sherry, Niraj, and Greg can join us um, today. And um, with that, I will kick off and have Sherry take over. Okay. Good morning. Okay, I'll do share screen two. Let's see if this will work. Um, oh, here we go. I see I get to pick what I want. So I should double click maybe. There we go, yay. Okay, so I would like to spend some time sharing with you the model we developed. I developed it uh, working with Ade and with uh, Guarantee Trust Bank help sponsor of Nigerian society. And when we did this, it was 2010. So it was 10 years ago now. However, these models are made so they're very, very stable. So they don't change that often. A lot of people know market research as being much more short-lived, like you do you might do a very quick cluster analysis and then you know you have to do something a month later. In this case, this is this lasts for decades. And so um, we're gonna just have a little sense of what this is all about. Now, when we got to Nigeria, one of the things I learned is that most oh, business sorry. people, yes. Um, can you put your um, presentation mode? Presentation mode. Of your PowerPoint. Yes, I can, if I can find where that mode is. I yeah. think it's right here. Yeah. Slideshow. Okay. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, I can see a little better. When we got to um, Nigeria, I discovered that most business people, their lens for which they saw the society was through um, either tribe, through occupation, or through age. And um, these are certainly important ways of understanding people. And what we brought, which was new and uh, um, innovation in and of itself was a psychological understanding or a way to look at the society. So we basically did a whole country segmentation of everybody ages 16 and older. We worked with at the time uh, research market services to do um, a major, major survey questionnaire of a very large scale random sample of Nigeria. We talked to something like 2,500 people and they answered something like 300 questions. So um, a great amount of data went into this. And what you see here is a distilled visualization of this model. So you can take all the adults in Nigeria and they live in one of these um, buckets. So for example, we have big man cynic makes up 4% of the society. The quiet achievers make up 10%. So you see that these have sizes and you usually have the larger size segments um, a little further down in the picture. So what I thought I would do today is give you two examples of how you can use this today in your workshop or going forward in, in your businesses. And then also just a little description of each of the types. So we've got uh, nine segments here and um, how people use this is on a more simple level, they use it to help clarify in their minds and their plans, who are my target consumers? Or for example, who are my prospects? or any other kind of stakeholder. You may have a business, like if you have a chain of um, supermarkets or grocery stores, you may find that you have a mix of customers and you wanna target some like quiet achievers for a certain kind of promotion or effort. You may find that you're bringing um, something truly novel into the society. So you may have to decide who's gonna be really my first adopter segment. So 
each of these segments has a profile and you can kind of match. Some people do an intuitive match. They say, oh, this would be great for this group based on the benefits offered. And some people do more, more research. Um, one other thing before we start to visit the segments that I wanted to share with you uh, from my experience is the importance of understanding what's called the competitive substitute. Uh, in working with entrepreneurs over the years, um, I've noticed that a lot of people have a good intuition for who their um, initial consumer target is for an innovation. And they might even have a really good sense of the benefit. The benefit in this case is the, um, is the subjective experience of using your product or service, but they haven't really thought a whole lot about the competitive substitute, which is basically what is it that the people can do instead of using your product? And you could almost fill it in. You could give yourself the mental exercise that says, what else can they do instead? And that helps you understand what your competition is. And, and that just leads to a lot of reason why innovation um, tanks is that people didn't think about that uh, competitive substitute. And remember that the instead can be nothing. People, you know, inertia can be an instead. So I'll leave you with those two questions as we visit some of these segments. All right, here we go. Um, oh, let me say one other thing just to give you a little broad. You'll notice that this picture is organized by, um, we have some traditional segments, some achievement segments, and some self-expression segments. This is to help at a very high level, um, achievement motivated types of people this is very simplistic, but they tend to see life as a ladder. You're, you're going up, you're going down, you're seeking position, you want to get ahead. Um, you might be more inclined to do X to get Y. It is truly about achieving, about seeking a better life. Um, traditional people tend to be a little more communal or collective oriented. They tend to see that whatever is best for the group is likely to be truly in their best interest too. This is a different, a different type of motive. And self-expression has a lot to do with, you know, really seeking excitement and stimulation and um, a lot of novelty. So those are just some broad differences and we'll, we'll visit some groups now. Okay, we have in your society, the big man cynic, which makes up 4% of Nigerian society. Um, you can see down in the bottom left, what the tribal split is, the gender split, and some cultural examples of who you have. This is a group of leaders. These are people who, um, you know, they would like to have power. They want to possess power. And I'll just read you one sentence. They participate or subscribe to communal values on what we call a utilitarian basis. So it's basically not good business not to go to church is a kind of very simple way of putting it. We don't have much time this morning, so I might go to some very simple statements. My apologies in advance if it ruffles some people. But it's just a sense of how power works, and it's 4% of your society. These are probably very critical people in the world of negotiation, in the world of leading business. So you kind of really want to understand the mindset of what you're working with here. So you can also, you'll re we'll receive these too. So you'll have a chance to take a look at these slides. So we've got 4% of big man civic. Um, and then we won't stop here right at the moment because we won't have time, but on your takeaways, you'll see some examples of the general, general uh, attitudes there. Then we have, and this is a picture of Ade here <laughs> in the corner. We had a very, very small group called Big Men Principle. It was only 1%, but it was really important to capture this group because they are um, very respected people in the society. I mean, both Big Man Cynic and Big Man Principle are respected, but it's a high status group. Um, but there's a sense that um, they seek esteem and respect through knowledge acquisition and strong leadership but they have a very different kind of flavor. So for example, the big man cynic in an iconic example might be someone like a uh, Rupert Murdoch who may have the idea that if it's legal, it's moral, just to give you one iconic example. 
big man principle means someone like Ade, someone like going back in history, Kenyatta, um, um, Jomo Kenyatta may be another example. So it has uh, a little more of a social responsibility angle. Um, so just to give you some, some quick shortcuts here. Uh, and there's some principles there. Uh, I thought, let me just do a check-in. Is this working for everybody? Just kind of getting a little flavor of your different psychological types. Okay, please, I'll keep rolling. Um, then we have a group of types um, that one's called a pace setter. They represent 8% of the Nigerian population. And you, these are your trendiest people. They are younger, they're part of the vanguard. Um, the rest of society moves too slowly. They have uh, a strong desire for new media, new entertainment. Um, they're not looking for your approval. They're not looking to be crowd pleasers. Uh, they are opinion leaders. They are Nollywood people, advertising, feminist students. So this is where you're going to find people who are going to be pushing the edge of um, what's socially okay to do. They're going to invent new forms of language, new forms of dress. They're going to shake things up. So this is your pace setter group. They play a big role, as you might imagine, in um, some kinds of innovation. So I'll take a look there. Uh, moving along. So now we're going to look on the other side. We have also a, a traditionals group, which is about 8%. And just like the name implies, this is full on traditional values. And fashion is a distraction from realizing the good society. Um, this is a lot where people say, I value what stood the test of time. They're older. Um, they have a sense of um, cooperation with the people around them. You know, you don't want to fail to honor convention, this kind of thing. So this is probably not your most um, early innovative group, but eventually they will accommodate the context of this over time. So we actually saw that you had um, a number, you can see down in the cultural examples, we had some traditional traders, the Benin merchants, bakers, rubber farmers. It was largely more men than women and a mix of tribal um, groups there. Uh, the middle class, now we're starting to get to a pretty sizable group. This is 15% of Nigerian society. And this is gonna be a big group of consumers for anybody that's um, kind of moving beyond, let's say a niche product or service. And this is, this is just, this is the heart of stability in a society. This is stability over, let's say, prestige or stability over advancement. Um, it's a real balance of a family-oriented life. Uh, they're wanting a predictable social reality. Uh, they may have the impression that life could operate more favorably for them, but and they may do some things that are um, kind of on the margins of the status quo, but it has to really fit into a predictable and understandable context. This is not a home of a lot of risk-taking. Um, so, and I'll also read you one sentence here that's interesting. To the degree they want to attract attention, it is to showcase a confirmation of their beliefs, of the belonging that they have. The shortcut word here is stability, stability over prestige. And you have your, a lot of self-employed students, skilled laborers, um, you have more women here, 58% women. Moving along. Now we have this big group, 20%, the facilitators. They were really interesting because they, um, their nickname was area boys or um, facilitators, area boys, local boys. This is the heart of adventuresome. These are people that are willing to step up and try something different if they think um, the status quo can operate more favorably for them. They're, they've, they'll take a little risk, they'll do something a little different. Um, they, they are approval seeking in the sense that they need to be valued by their peer or by the pack. What's risky for them is not so much to break the technical law, but to operate outside of approval. So they're kind of impatient with intellectual stuff. Um, and they're a big chunk, they're 20% of your population. <clears throat> Not surprising that it skews more male, but there's still 45% women. And this is a picture of a gentleman we met 
um, who was a facilitator, very ambitious. You see things as stepping stones to the next goal in life, well informed he wanted to be a politician. Put that through. Um, the Quiet Achievers, this was a segment that was very surprising to um, the business people we presented this to. They didn't really realize that they existed in this society. Um, we had a, there was an example of the picture down in the bottom right. Um, this is a group that's almost entirely female, and this happens in different countries sometimes. Very competent women who balance their own desire for achievement with family and community responsibilities. Um, they're not trying to like get to the next station in life or necessarily climb the ladder. They're settled in the life they have, uh, but they also are a big part of, I think, keeping things glued together and keeping things going. I imagine that there are a lot of quiet achievers um, who play very pivotal roles in making sure jobs get done and, and um, essentially, they operate on a low persistent flame. They're always there. There's a lot of reliability there. Um, so we had some, a lot of professional women, housewives, Bible readers, uh, but a very, very female group and an essential group. Uh, <clears throat> they mostly admired school teachers and pastors, by the way. So each one of these groups had a sort of admiration. We're kind of wrapping up here and I'll go back to the main picture in a second. We had Strivers, which was your other really large group, 19% of Nigerian um, society. Strivers were the youngest in age. Um, they kind of in a way had a strong wish for what they believe was the Western kind of lifestyle. Um, a lot of fantasy, a lot of a, kind of a sense of, I want a more exciting life. I wish I had a fast car a lot of sense of how do I look, what's my appearance, um, a little bit of the macho kind of thing. Quote, they'd rather play football on Sunday than go to church, that kind of thing. Oops, I think I just got popped out of uh, the uh, presentation, but I'll see if I can go back in there. And there's a couple of pictures down there. Um, so with in most every society that we've been to, there usually is a pretty strong striving element too. And they play more of a role in defining a mass market. And I'll go through and show you a few diffusion paths in a moment, but these usually aren't your first because there's more of an imitative conformist bent here. Um, but they certainly play a role in um, developing a larger size mass market. In our, the bottom group right now, we have the masses at 15. And this was an inherently um, conserving group, very survival focused, practically focused, um, probably not that involved in the formal economy. Um, we had rural farmers, slightly more men, a large contingent of the Hausa tribe fell into this group. Here, I, I don't think that there's necessarily a fear of innovation among masses. I think it's more that if it doesn't work out like a new farming practice that, you know, I don't think that you wanna to fail to honor the existing convention. It could be problematic if that were to occur. So it's not so much that there's a fear, but um, it's more that you don't want something to go wrong and then wrong for survival itself. So let me see now, I will wanna zip back. How am I doing on time? I got a few more minutes. Let me go back here now. Um, I've sort of given you a lot of information and I certainly, you know, I know it's not really easy to retain all that, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of a tour of the scope of variation that we see. And, you know, what you usually do, depending on the type of innovation, you've got something new and it has, it'll have a certain kind of range of benefits. It can enter a society in different ways. For example, if you have an innovation in how to, um, in knowledge or in ideas or a new kind of intellectual property approach, you may see that it comes in through the big man principle would be your first adopters and probably diffuse more down to traditional, um, maybe quiet achiever. So this tends to be the area, the traditional innovator is someone who is bringing in like a new form of justice, a new form of um, a health practice. The big man cynic is usually going to be bringing in um, 
anything that really aids in productivity. So for example, in different societies, these were the earliest adopters of um, smartphones, of um, new, like for example, um, blogging. It's a way to do social networking. Um, anything that would also indicate new forms of prestige. It could be home furnishings. It could be um, uh, large screen TVs, things that really touch on enhanced productivity, enhanced exclusivity, that kind of thing. And then over here, you usually find your earliest adopters, your what we call the self-expression innovation is really about media, dress, language, so these are broad groupings, but I'm trying to show you that you've got three sort of trajectories for innovation. It can, it can come in this way, it can come in this way, it can come in this way. If you really want to get a mass market, you have to kind of get these opinion leader groups, which I would say are the quiet achievers in the middle class. That's what helps you really shower through to a larger group of people. So there is a, a diffusion flow, if you will, and, and uh, at the risk of maybe giving you a little more, um, I like to sometimes complicate it only because life is complicated, right? So, oh, I lost my card. You can sometimes, sometimes an innovation will come in through a pay setter group, but because this group tends to be very quick to interest and then quick to cool, it'll come in and then bounce out. So it may not make it. So you do have to kind of steer and change sometimes your messaging and the benefits to sort of get through, to cross over, if you will. Um, sometimes innovations that come in through the traditional innovation, they're slow moving, right? They don't happen very quickly. They have to get absorbed and assimilated into a context, especially when you're, you know, you're dealing with things like traditional things that have stood the test of time. You have to really kind of it has to do something, it has to be functionally superior. Traditional innovations have to be functionally superior. So for example, you know, the very early Microsoft Excel products were truly functionally superior than a calculator. People got that. And they actually were adopted in the world more by traditional innovators. On the other hand, if you look about the early cell phones where you could do talking to business people, you didn't have to waste time while you're sitting in traffic. That's really gonna come for, that was really first adopted by achievement oriented kinds of people because it facilitated business, it facilitated social networking. You know, it, it really helped move things along, never slow you down. Of course, pace setters are famous for lots of things, but you know, a lot of the social internet DVD technologies and things over here. So I think I will just pause now and um, uh, see if uh, anybody has questions or I will sit back and can let you come forward. Yeah, Terry, thanks a lot. Um, that sure. was very excellent. Um, so I hope most of you are seeing, this is looking at the Nigerian society from a the whole of, um, it, I think, Sherry and myself went to the six geopolitical zones. Um, Sherry, one of the things you said you had seen in your data um, when you did this survey was uh, an indication that we were going to have some problems with Boko Haram. How did you see that in your data? Uh, okay. Um... Right. How did, let me see that. I remember that question. You can, I'll ask you later if you look for the. No, no, the, I think, okay. let me see. You know, here's the thing that gets to the really, the, that actually gets to the competitive substitute issue. And I've seen it in Nigeria and I've also seen it in Lebanon. So when people don't have a convincing upward mobility path, obviously they might be more um, attracted to another solution. And sometimes that is gonna be various gradations or shades of what we call terrorism. Um, and when you have, especially the strivers and the facilitators um, are, and to some extent, maybe the pace setters and middle class, but really the strivers and facilitators, um, they're likely to uh, get involved um, 
because it's offering a kind of me first benefit. It's offering a little bit of a fantasy. It's offering things that they can't get um, by following um, the status quo way. So that becomes a kind of um, competitive benefit or a competitive substitute to living life in a, um, if you will, a more kind of conventional way. And there is sometimes um, people will do small projects or small jobs for small amounts of money. Um, so they're, they're recruitable, you know, they're recruitable. What tends to happen in societies is that, uh, you know, people, especially in that achievement motivation, the facilitators, they look up to the big man cynic and they say, I can be like that someday. And so they form a kind of power arc between the big man cynic forms a kind of, they, they recruit the facilitator to kind of push people around for them. And they can become contrarians in a society and you can really have that. So these groups, these, these types can kind of work together like magnets, they can come together or they can repel each other. Does that sort of touch on? So I, it's just, I think when we interview people, you could see that when you have corruption, when you have people trying to make their me first way, if I want a better life, I'm gonna to start to look at alternatives that may be traditionals and middle-class people who value stability, wish they wouldn't look at. Yeah, that, that kind of gets it, yeah, because we, we recently had um, the NSAS campaign in Nigeria which mm -hmm. um, threw a lot of things up. And I think being able to identify the particular demands and the groups and things like that would have um, helped policymakers address them. Um, so thanks a lot for that, um, Sherry. Um, right. Before passing on to Greg, I'll share a few of um, a kind of personal story about mapping. Um, Sherry, let me... I'll... Sure, let me get off the... Uh... Um, so what Sherry has done has been to look at the mapping from the point of view of the consumer. Um, what I'll show now before handing over to Greg is to look at a mapping from the point of view of an engineer. And um, because you have to map both sides. So I'll just show uh, what I've just termed a personal story. Um, just to give you an example. Um, the first time I came across the idea of mapping was really in the US when we had to do some projects um, very early on. And the place we consulted was the CIA Factbook because the CIA constantly monitors different countries and collects information. And these are information that you'll say, well, if we have to go to war with this country, what are the facilities we have to bomb first? And that's a very, very key part of when you do a mapping. Um, however, once the information becomes um, old, they turn it over to civilians. So one of the things, and I'm hoping that we have some people in the intelligence service here, because their information can be useful to entrepreneurs. Because after mapping, if you don't need the information after five years, you can turn it over to civilians and we can use it um, to effect. So this was the CIA, but another group that had to do mapping was um, Biafra. That Biafra was blockaded and they then had to develop an internal group called the Research and Production Group, which did a number of very interesting things. They converted agricultural tractors into armored vehicles. Um, they had these modular um, petrol refineries that they moved around and um, they actually had uh, um, converted uh, aircraft into a jet fighter, a bomber aircraft. And so this inspired me several years ago. And I think um, um, we had a group in Abelkuta at the Institute for Venture Design. And we decided to have a prompt. Imagine there's a war in Abelkuta and Abelkuta is blockaded. And so they had this question, what tools and machines exist in Abelkuta where they located, who makes things in Abelkuta, what are the labor costs like? And they had to go through all these questions and begin to map the area of Abelkuta. Okay, where's the wood? Ah, oh, where's the plastic material? Oh, there's a river there and things like that. That's um, Niraj there. Um, where are the old computers? 
Because as you saw in Biafra, people were able to really convert all these things. They all, all technology has dual purpose use. Um, so things like that. Now, based on that kind of tinkering around, we had them begin to produce output. Um, this was people producing cars, people producing just different things. So when we begin to look at technology, um, it, it, it has this same thing as, as Sherry was looking at the consumers. As we begin to study our tinkerers or our makers, we have a lot of natural makers in society, um, they actually have the possibility of allowing us to develop new technology. I'll end with this very short movie, um, a clip from a movie to introduce to Greg, but I want you to note um, this is a story of Apple computer, but pay attention to how, what the first Apple computer looked like. Um, can you hear the sound? In 1976, the only yes, people who believed in the personal computer were the geeks and nerds who gathered at homebrew computer clubs. At one such club, 21-year-old Steve Jobs had partnered with Steve Wozniak to create a circuit board kit they called the Apple One. Steve Jobs was working at Atari at the time, so the most obvious person to ask for startup money was his boss, Nolan Bushnell. He needed an investment, and uh, they offered me a third of the Apple computer for $50,000, and I said, gee, I don't think so. I could have owned a third of Apple computer for $50,000. A big mistake. But I said, call Don Valentine, because Don had a high probability of seeing the opportunity. So we had our meeting. I went to Steve's house, and we talked. And I was convinced it was a big market just embryonically beginning. Steve was in his Fu Manchu look. And his question for me, tell me what I have to do to have you finance me. I said, we have to have someone in the company who has some sense of management and marketing and channels of distribution. He said, fine, send me three people. I sent him three candidates. One he didn't like, one didn't like him. And the third one was Mike Markla. Mike Markle worked for me at Fairchild before he went to Intel. He called me up and said, there's two guys over in Los Altos that, that uh, could really use your help. And you ought to go see him. I said, okay, because that's what I did on Mondays. I was retired. <laughs> I think I was 32 and I retired from Intel. But one day a week, I would help people start companies and write business plans. And I did it for free, just from the interaction with bright uh, people that had a lot of fire in their belly. So I went over and talked to the boys. <laughs> the two of them did not make a good impression on people. Uh, they were bearded. They didn't smell good. They dressed funny, young, naive. But Woz had designed a really wonderful, wonderful computer technology that was really advanced. The problem was you could walk down the street in 1976 and talk to 100 people and say, would you like a personal computer? And they'd go, well, what's that? And so I told them, I said I'd help them write a business plan. So I got to working on it. And I, I said, gosh, you know, the opportunity here is just too great. The business plan said that uh, with $142,000, we could be cash flow positive in nine months. And I came to the conclusion that we could build a Fortune 500 company in less than five years. I said I'd put up the money that was needed. Not only do you write the check, Mike Markle came out of retirement, becoming the president and CEO of Apple.
Okay. So I hope that begins to look at, as you map the ecosystem, not only are you discovering what kind of wood and things like that people can tinker with, but you're also looking at what talent exists within the ecosystem. And with what Sherry has presented, you're looking at what the consumers are. So a mapping of the ecosystem basically allows you to cover both the financial, the talent, and the consumers all together. And so with that, I hope you're beginning to see that really this mapping exercises, um, this mapping exercises are very critical to moving from the baseline to the leading edge of innovation. With that, I'll hand over to Greg. There we go. It was refusing to let me unmute myself. Okay. Well, thank you, Ade. I come at this from a, a different perspective because I come out of the business and market side of things. I'm a serial entrepreneur and venture capital investor. So I see companies and the ground truth from the practice and uh, um, ecosystem side. And as I took my experience from building companies, and then I semi-retired and came back to uh, San Diego where I work with the University of California in one of the very first uh, innovation incubators uh, in the world. Um, and then we took that model and grew it to a network of 57 programs in 25 countries. We learned a lot about the entrepreneurial and ecosystem process. And what we're gonna talk about today is a bit of that. But, you know, my work always begins with uh, uh, more than just a single step, it actually begins with a series of questions. I watch things and then I uh, ask questions and those questions then lead me to interesting things. And the question I was asking was, why is innovation so hard? If we're writing about it, if we're researching it, if we have all this historical knowledge of innovation, why have we still failed to do it at any kind of scale? And what we realize is that 99% of what makes innovation happen in a community, in a company, um, is completely invisible. Well, we very often focus on the tangible aspects of innovation, like building incubators and venture funds, uh, the prototypes and artifacts themselves. What actually makes that innovation happen in the first place is uh, more experiential and you sense it rather than touch it. And so what we're gonna talk about today really talks about the two models we were observing. Now, this first model is something you will relate to because it's the way we've been teaching business and entrepreneurship uh, for many years, this model of production and in the industrial economies, which actually started with the agrarian economies, that they were models of scarcity. That if you think back to the early origins of things like the agrarian and industrial economies, they were built on a set of resources, whether they were land and water, seeds, crops. We had finite time and uh, assets at our disposal to turn them into something valuable. So we focused on things like efficiency and scalability and profitability. And the models we built look like these. These are models we're all familiar with because they're nice and linear. What we first appreciated is that we have bent nature to our will in these models. Nature doesn't naturally look like this, but we bend nature to our will because it makes it certainly more efficient and we waste fewer resources when we do that. And we're able to drive more predictive uh, outcomes. So efficiency yields uh, and the outcomes and eventually the impact. And we use the same model over and over again. Uh, we use it the way we produce uh, cars and widgets uh, and even today, the way we produce uh, uh, computer chips is exactly the same way we produce crops. We do it linear because it's the most efficient. And the human capital we look for in these types of business are those that don't make mistakes. So our universities, our training and skills programs are all focused on helping people divide, uh, develop expertise and then apply that expertise in a way that they're useful to the company. But we were seeing a different model at play in places like the Silicon Valley and places that were doing innovation quite well. And we called these models uh, those based on abundance rather than scarcity. 
because in the scarcity model, we had only so much time and land and water uh, to work with. But in abundance models, we were using ideas as the fuels for innovation. And so where you and I get together and exchange interesting ideas uh, around a cup of coffee, we both walk away with more than we came with. And if you do that across an entire community or an entire ecosystem, what you end up doing is take all the resources to infinity rather than to zero. And Matt Ridley said that that is quite true, that innovation is when ideas have sex and it requires this combining and recombining and design and redesign of things to really make innovation happen. And those look quite differently because in the first war, everything was manicured and made uh, uh, linear for innovation to happen. This looks very natural and messy. And if I were to ask you the most important thing in this picture, in this rainforest, it would be hard to understand because everything looks important and quite beautiful, but really the most important thing that is in this picture is probably the weeds we're standing on. The weeds are the things that don't look like they belong, but eventually become the Googles, the Apples, the Ubers, the Instagrams. And not only do the ideas sound quirky and weird when we first look at them, the people who start these companies look quirky and weird. And as you just heard uh, from the video clip that Ade played, no one really sees these people initially as something of value because we have nothing to compare them to. And therein lies kind of the problem because these entrepreneurs who are changing the world and creating new futures march to a different drummer. They hear different kinds of music, but no one else hears that same music. And when we go to the experts of the time and ask them what the next big innovation is, they always fail to do that because the true paradox of innovation is that it's only measured once it's been imitated, once it's been copied, once it's been diffused and adopted. And yet we try with our innovation ecosystems to try to promote the creation of innovation. And you have to be careful because when you always go to the experts, they will always tell you that what you're working on isn't necessary and doesn't have any value. And this goes back to the telephone. It goes back to uh, uh, airplane flight. But even recently, we haven't gotten any smarter. We even said this when computers were first introduced, that we don't need such things. They're not going to be helpful to us. And that's why we find that imagination is far more important than knowledge, because uh, knowledge will only keep you on what you know today and what you knew in the past. But imagination will take you off the edges of the map and will take you into the future, into these places that no one's ever thought of exploring. And instead of just merely hiring people in the first model who don't make mistakes, the kind of people I need to hire are people who can pro solve problems who can lean into a lot of the uncertainty and ambiguity and who are dynamic and creative in the way that they think. Because as uh, this apocryphal quote from Edison says, it's not so much that these mistakes are mistakes, they're just ways of not doing things. And that becomes new knowledge and that knowledge is very, very important because it teaches us about the path forward. And so we have to think of these mistakes or these unintended consequences of our actions as not merely things that define us in the moment, but they add knowledge. And so we actually wear them like a badge of honor. So the first rule of innovation you need to embrace is you cannot make it happen. You cannot innovate on demand. The first rule of innovation is you can only increase the chances of it happening. And what that means is when we're building plantations, we're always trying to engineer a process to drive a specific outcome. But when we build plantations, we're trying to engineer the environment. And we're trying to engineer serendipity. What we're trying to do, we're optimizing a set of conditions rather than trying to control them. And that's why when we look at innovation, we often try to control the connection between an action and an outcome. So if we want more startups, we just need to create more incubators or more venture funds. And that's historically where we tend to focus. But what in our research we found is that really all the actions, as Sherry was saying, our actions are a result of our behaviors. And our behaviors are really a result of our values, our intentions, our motivations, and ultimately our beliefs. And if we could figure out how we affect belief systems, both at individual and scale, that should predictably drive different kinds of outcomes. And we found that that is truly the secret of the Silicon Valley, that their belief systems are quite different because when you believe something, I don't have to go to you every day and remind you that you believe it. But if you don't believe something, no matter how much evidence or information I present to you, 
it's still difficult for you to, to adopt it, particularly if you're holding a different belief system. And therein lies the idea that all innovation is human centric, that when we create, when we invent, when we put our beliefs into the world as artifacts and new inventions, those are all in uh, human centric because someone has to do something with them to give them meaning. And that's why what we say is it's only when what we think and what we feel kind of aligns, we get this kind of belief system. It's when the head and the heart connect. And even beyond that, it's we have to connect the head and the heart, but eventually we have to put it into our hands. And then we say into our heels because we have to walk into the world and change things. And our work is really how to do that. So when you're as an entrepreneur, you can't just think like an economist. You can't just think about dollars and cents, bottom lines and, and what it means. You also have to think like a psychologist because again, if we're trying to change the mindset of people, it's important. And the reason I like this quote, and we even have this quote in our book, is because this quote says, if you want people to help you build a ship, it's not about giving them tasks and telling them who's going to hammer this piece of wood or who's going to build this sail. What you want to do is you want to teach them to yearn for the sea and to yearn for being out on the sea. Because when everyone has a collective vision, you then hit their head and their heart and that gets them to do it. It's what we call purpose. Now, in order to make this stuff happen, two things are really important. One is you have to have ambiguity and discomfort because it's only when things are not clear and uncomfortable that we go and seek answers. We go and talk to other people and we get out of our chairs and out of buildings to go do that because it's not in our comfort zones that all the interesting things happen. It's outside of our comfort zone that we do it. The other condition is you have to bring people around you who are both uninformed and intelligent. Because if you only surround your people with experts, then you'll always get iterations of their existing thinking. But if you bring people who are different than you, then the debate, the discussion, the dissents, the friction that occurs is where all the interesting opportunities and possibilities lie. And those are the things you're gonna to wanna to explore as part of innovation. So how do we do this? We created a series of tools and one of the tools you're gonna be using today in the exercise. The first one though, is what we call the rainforest canvas. Just as in your human body, we've learned how to sequence the human genome, which tells us about you and what you do. We do the same thing with what's called a rainforest canvas, which is built on design thinking principles. And what it looks like is like this. And the reason we call it a canvas is because like an artist canvas, it starts off blank and we paint upon it. But what we do is we've structured it in such a way that these are the building blocks of an innovation ecosystem and an ecology. And as in all ecologies, everything relates to everything else and everything serves a greater purpose, in this case, the stakeholders. And there's a series of questions we can ask, but don't forget early on when you're creating anything, all you really have are a series of opinions, hypotheses, observations, conjectures, and a few facts. And ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to on surface an opportunity is you're trying to explore and validate your own assumptions and hypotheses. How do we validate or invalidate what we know? And that's, these are just some of the questions we would ask ourselves about who do we need to participate? What do they need to do? What do we have at our disposal? How are we going to communicate with them? How do we create the culture around those? And these are the things that appeal to the head, uh, as we were saying. But we also have to appeal to the heart. And so as we said, what makes the Silicon Valley quite unique or the model that we want to emulate is we have to take those things that are implicit, means we sense and we feel that are invisible and we have to make them explicit. And that is why we create this social contract construct, which uh, Niraj is gonna walk you through. And this is the garage of Hewlett Packard in the Silicon Valley. This is where Hewlett Packard started. But what they started with was not a mission statement or a vision statement. Back in 1939, they started with the rules of the garage, which was their statement of beliefs. They wanted to say what was in their hearts before they talked about what was in their heads. And this was really, really important because it then created an alignment of intention rather than an alignment only focused on opinions. And that's why Peter Drucker said the culture will always eat strategy for breakfast, that you have to start with this higher level purpose because that's what brings people together is purpose. So in our new paradigm, we have to move from the left to the right. The old models are about knowing everything and just practicing what we already know. 
and then rules-based approaches, whereas the right-hand side is all about learning and adapting, learning from one another, doing a lot of experiments, but learning from those experiments. And you follow those who actually practice what they preach as opposed to who just generally talk about what they're gonna do. And so we have these rules of the rainforest that we often live by, which is while there are rules out there that sometimes the only way to move forward is to sometimes break the rules. And you have to dream, you have to use your imagination. But trust becomes the primary currency of what you're doing because people have to believe in you before they believe in some outcome that you haven't created yet. And that requires you to seek fairness rather than advantage. Because if we all treat people fairly, then we all share in the risks, but we also share in the rewards. And ultimately, when we do benefit from all this, we pay it forward as a way of nurturing the future as opposed to just merely honoring the present. And so the final truth that I'm gonna leave you with is true, well, without order, nothing can exist. Without chaos, nothing can evolve. So it's this balance of rainforest and plantations between equilibrium and evolution that will determine kind of how we go forward. But ultimately, you know, you have to create a little chaos in order to kind of change the status quo. So with that, uh, I will leave you and Ade, I will turn it back to you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Greg. Um, so one of the things that um, we looked at, um, I think, um, Greg, sorry, can you put up um, the, ah, okay, that's good, I've seen Niraj. Let me hand over to Niraj um, to pick up from the um, social contract, yeah. Okay, Niraj. Thank you, Ade. Uh, so what I'll start with is to give an overview of what the social contract is. So what we'll do now is an activity. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen here. Oops, what is this? Ah, here it is. Great, okay. Uh, so this is a set of social contract slides that Greg has put together. And I'll walk you through that uh, to give you a sense of what is this nature of activity that we'll be doing. Um, so the first one is, you know, why create a social contract? Why have a contract at all? You have seen the uh, contract that was developed by the Hewlett Packard founders and the founding team. And, and the reason for it is to make what is implicit explicit. When we come together as a group of people within an ecosystem and start working together, there are some implicit norms and to really make it explicit is important because then we can actually actively shape them. Uh, the second, it acts as a commitment statement, a statement of alignment. So we all know how we are behaving together and where we are going. It becomes a catalyst for action, a set of guiding principles. And in the end, it helps to foster, you know, love, inspiration, hope, trust, and respect, all the positive feelings. Once we have the, the interstitial tissue that binds us all made explicit, we can move on in a positive way. Uh, what a social contract is not, it's not a legally binding document. We're not creating a legal document. It is not the 10 commandments. It doesn't assert morality that, you know, that you should behave a certain way. Uh, but it is a document of hope. Uh, it is not an asymmetric agreement that it doesn't favor certain parties. It's, it's not a position to do power plays and it's not dogmatic. Um, one of the suggestions, well, you know, some of the suggestions we have is really to start with the why when we are making a social contract, focus on the verbs. We are really focusing on actions here, uh, using empathetic words and then using linking language. Uh, you have seen Greg talk about this sequence, you know, beliefs leading to behaviors, leading to actions and outcomes. Uh, in today's activity, we'll not be doing the entire contract because it does take quite some time, about half a day uh, for a group such, such that we are. Uh, so we'll start the, we'll take the first step in doing the social contract and that will set us up to take the subsequent steps later on. Uh, today, we'll focus on the behaviors. Uh, we'll try to articulate some of the behaviors uh, that we see in the ecosystem that we'd like to see less of, some of the behaviors we see in the ecosystem that we'd like to see more of. Um, you know, uh, these are the rules of the rainforest we just saw and heard them from Greg, and uh, rules of the garage. This was the social contract. This is an 
example that we put up as a great social contract developed by uh, Bill Yolet and Dave Packen. Um, we have done quite a few of these social contracts with various groups the world over. You know, here's an example of a social contract developed by a group based on the rainforest rules and the rainforest principles. Uh, we'll not go through it in a lot of detail, but this just gives you a flavor of what the ultimate result might look like for your community. Uh, just to make, make a note once again, we'll not get there right now in this workshop. We are just taking the first step. Uh, so what we'll do is that uh, we'll uh, separate ourselves into breakout rooms. Uh, so the we have organized uh, multiple breakout rooms and we'll actually go into different rooms. And then within each room, we'll have a shared whiteboard in which we can actually uh, put down some of our thinking and behaviors. So what I'll do is give you a demo of how to use that whiteboard. I keep getting this taskbar here of Zoom. Uh, here it is, okay. Uh, so this is an app called as Mural. Uh, so each, each, each room uh, will have roughly five participants and you know each, each room will get a mural board. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, for each group to reflect on their personal behaviors and experiences that you have had while working in the Nigerian innovation ecosystem. Uh, and really think about these two questions. You know, what are some of the behaviors that you would like to see less of? Uh, from your own experience, you know, from your own work, uh, from the interactions that you have had in the ecosystem, what have you observed that you would like to see less of? So uh, you can take some time within the group to discuss this question and you can put in post-its uh, to write down your responses. And the way to write a post-it is to do a right click and you get this kind of a, a menu and you can say, add sticky note. And it's, it's very small. <laughs> so you can make it larger and then you can write something in it. You know, You can write about what behaviors uh, let's just say my behavior. Uh, you can write uh, what whatever behavior you want to point out. You know, if you have a little story, mention that story in a few sentences. Uh, but the more we keep it grounded in reality, the better. Uh, so this is the first question, and then uh, you can spend half the time discussing the second question. What are some of the behaviors that you would like to see more of? Uh, these are once again real behaviors in the ecosystem. We are not making up hypothetical behaviors. We are not putting in things which we have not seen in Nigeria, seen in something else, you know, some other ecosystem. But we are actually seeing what do you see right now that you would like to see more of. I, and the result for this one, you know, this kind of an approach is that we are dealing with a complex system uh, in a Nigerian innovation ecosystem. And the way to move the complex system is not just to create uh, you know, a set of aspirational values. We need those, but also to understand you know, what are the adjacent possibilities to move the system? What currently exists that we'd like to see more of? What currently exists that we'd like to see less of? And then using that approach to slowly shift the system towards the direction that we would like it to go. Uh, so this is the whiteboard. Uh, what I'll do now is I, in the chat box, I'll put together the links to the different boards for each room. And I'll also, once you have gone into the breakout rooms, my uh, experience is that you do not have access to the chat in the main room. So I'll visit each room and give you your whiteboard link once again, in case you don't receive it right now. Uh, so let me stop my share and give you the various uh, whiteboard links. So uh, we have created a one whiteboard for each room and uh, these are visitor links. So you don't have to sign in, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you just have to follow the link. It might ask you to put your name or something which you can choose to do or not, that's fine. Um, but I think, and I need to send it to everyone, not just Adik. So let me make a change here. Great, so I believe we have eight rooms and I have just uh, sent in chat um, the whiteboard links. So Ahmed, uh, could you please start the breakout session?
So I hope I hope we are starting it. I do not have a respond. I think I get this join breakout room thing. Uh, let me just go to gallery view. Yeah. I think he's assigning people already. Oh, good. Very good. Yeah. Because um, I see the numbers reduce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So what I'll do now is I'll go to each room and, you know, uh, make sure that you have the link for your whiteboard. Greg, you've seen the questions. Uh, the questions, just the ones he just put up. Those two, yeah. OK. What you may want to do for consistency is during uh, this time pause the recording because all it won't re be recording anything. Oh, okay. have about uh, fourteen minutes before we complete uh, this workshop session. Uh, so let's take a, let's go through a few bots. We may not have time to actually go through each group and hear what they have done, uh, but we'll select a few bots randomly. And what I suggest is that uh, you know we'll actually compile all the bots into a PDF and we'll send it to you after the workshop. Uh, so let's actually go to a few of the rooms and see what the conversation was like, and we'll get a flavor of you know what are some of the behaviors we'd like to do less of and we'd like to see more of. Uh, so could we uh, could we go to room one? I'll put up the board here. I have the link. Uh, It is room one. Okay. And I'll share my screen. Great. Uh, so this was room one. So can any one of the participants in room one give us a brief one minute summary of your conversation? Um, Shiru, do you want to take that? It's show here. Yeah? Okay. Oh, Indy. Oh, show is there. Yeah. Show, can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the of the group. Um, one thing uh, we've uh, all agreed on, uh, you know, at the end of the exercise is seeing the importance of how social contracts uh, promote uh, uh, the inner uh, being in us. Mm -hmm. So um, what we all, uh, the dashboard above shows uh, what behaviors that people in the group would like to see less of, uh, which are uh, distrust and suspicion Corruption, complacency, mental laziness, you know, imaginary glass ceiling and entitlement. And one thing we all agree that things that we like to see more of in, uh, be, in terms of behavior are more of collaboration rather than competition, mm. truth. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Then, the use of traditional language, excellence in execution, working with passion, collaboration, and creative entrepreneurship. Um, it's very interesting. We had a very um, interactive session within the group uh, with everybody contributing, and we all are in agreement that having this uh, right behaviors will promote the innovation in the Nigerian uh, ecosystem, in the, the Nigerian entrepreneurship ecosystem. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, sharing your highlights. 
I'm just curious, just one quick question. What does use of traditional language mean? I don't quite understand it. I'm curious to learn more. Okay, you know what? We're all talking about innovation, uh, whereby uh, a lot of people tend to uh, understand that you have to be literate or you have to understand the, 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 the official language, which is English, before oh, you I can see, see. Okay. something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. Very good. This is very helpful. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Let's uh, let's go to one more uh, room. Uh, let's see. Uh, shall we go to room five? Let me actually pull up the whiteboard. Uh, let me stop my share. Go to room five. Anyone from room five would like to give us a quick highlight? See some chats coming in. Oh, anyone from room five? If not, then we'll just have a look at the board and move on. Um. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Great. I'll be happy. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. All right, um, it's from group, group five. Uh, the first thing that we had there for the behaviors that we would like to see, we would like to see less, is a uh, uh, fear to dare. All right, mm -hmm. um, we actually said uh, a lot of people are too, too scared to take that step. And then religiosity, that we do take um, the place of where things we're supposed to do ourselves and then we just uh, kind of Blend them in in terms of religious, and then lack of lack of drive and the initiative taken. So a lot of people, a lot of Nigerians in this ecosystem are really struggling with that. The the lack the lack the drive to move on in indolence, um, lack of focus, followed through lack of uh, research and data backed uh, decision making. So saying that a lot of decisions we're taking are not uh, backed up by data. So that if we can actually um, push on to have more of that. So uh, these are some of the things that we have less and information hoarding. We, we discussed that we have a lot of uh, people who know more that if they could share more of that knowledge it would go a long way to um, help our status quo mindset. Um, a lot of people have that for themselves, a colonial past, I think that is blocking it. Mm -hmm. I can't really see that. Yeah. But we're seeing uh, that w that has a lot to do with the mindset that we have based on our own identity, not um, choosing and living for who we are. We are kind of, you know, because we are colonized by some people, we tend to behave like them. Uh, if we can begin to choose and identify ourselves as who we truly are. And then on the other hand of it, uh, the other side where we talked about what are some of the behaviors that you would like to see more, that we would like to see more. We talked about a positive energy, res result-oriented attitude, uh, dare to be different. And then we talked about collective thinking and responsibility, uh, desire to achieve and do more, collaboration and co cooperation. So we want more of this, we want to see more of this, dare to be different. Uh, solution-driven uh, approach and thinking that we talked about global outlook approach, um, uh, long-term thinking and planning and disruptive thinking. So these are some of the things that we hope to be seeing more in, uh, we would like to see more in our ecosystem. Thank you. Very good, yes. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing your highlights. Uh, this is great, fantastic. Uh, so we don't have a, a lot of time to go through the rest of the boards. As I mentioned, I'll compile it all into a PDF and share it with you. So you have a sense of what each group discussed. Uh, let me stop my share and talk about uh, what might be some of the next steps that could be taken if we had more time or these are some of the steps that you could take yourself. Uh, after collecting these boards, what we'll do is that, you know, we would have then uh, 
come together to create themes. So what each group discussed on. Some of the themes could be risk taking. I heard in room five uh, board, there was a lot about daring, you know, uh, dare to be different, uh, do not fear to dare. So there was things about risk taking, which would also associate with failure and how we respond to failure because they go together. Uh, so then we'll actually create these themes and from each of these themes, we'll derive a few actions that we would like to take as a community, uh, as well as some of the beliefs that we would like to hold as a community. And those beliefs and actions then become uh, the statements within the social contract. It might actually turn out that the social contract we start off with by doing this activity may be very long, uh, but if it is, then we may actually try to reduce it further and come up with a one pager, just like the Hewlett Packard statement was. Uh, so this is how we go through doing a social contract activity. The first step is what we did in this session, which was to gather people's responses, their stories, their, the behaviors they see we would like to do less of and some behaviors that we would like to see more of. Uh, so with that, let me pause here and hand over back to you, Ade, uh, to do the wrap up. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you've all, um, you all begin to have a taste of this ecosystem mapping. Um, a lot of people tend to think of mapping as just being external. It is both external and internal because our minds is actually what manifests itself outside. And if we don't find a way of mapping the internal ecosystem, then a lot of what we are planning will not come, um, will not come to pass. So really, I want to thank um, both um, Greg, Niraj, and Sherry had to leave because she had jury duty. Um, but I think what we wanted to give you was a sense of the need to have an ecosystem map, but both internal and external to the human being. And the internal one, you can see if we spend some more time, we begin to see behaviors that we have that we can now collectively agree, let's find a way to reduce the incidence of this belief and of this belief and behavior. And let's find a way to increase the incidence of the ones we like. And gradually we will begin to move our ecosystem in the direction in which we want. Um, well, so I'll then take this and hand over back to Adenike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before I do the uh, formal thanks and round up, I don't know if there, if we can take one or two questions. I know Theodore had put a question initially, um, and I think that question was probably for Sherry. Um, Theodore, um, the question has disappeared on the chat. I don't have it on my chat now. Do you want to quickly ask that question or have you left? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still here, but I'm, I'm trying to remember because it was in the previous session indeed. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the previous session, I was asking about um, yeah. middle class and um, yeah, I remember. what she was, how you can. Okay. Yeah. okay you the, the idea was like, how can they, uh, do we have examples of how they can adapt innovations or how they, they have been approached in the past successfully in order to adapt innovations? Um, try to answer that, but Sherry will be the expert. Um, one of the things they found in the VAL study is that um, the real mediator for the middle class, the vast majority, are the people they identify as facilitators or area boys. Um, but okay. it, will, it will then depend on the particular type of innovation. So probably you already know that a lot of politicians tend to use area boys to round up the people. But I think for some other types of innovation, you'll use a different pathway. Um, but area boys is like the go-to person for now. Um, is that it. along the lines of your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think um, it already gives a good um, idea of how it works. Thank you. Yes. Okay. 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 Anyone, we can take one more question if there is any, and if there's none, um, I will. We can take one more question. If I see a hand raised, okay, I don't see any hand raised. None. Okay, great. 
So um, thank you very, very much. Um, I have to say that when we started this conversation with Dr. Ade, um, I mean, by the time we started the conversation, it was clear that whatever we, we could do today really is just um, scratching the surface. Um, and, but I'm quite excited about the conversations we've already started. And, uh, and for me, it's even allowed me to think a bit more, even in terms of our approach to our work, because um, if we're not careful, we'll be addressing like the symptoms, but not the root causes. And just letting us even work and brainstorm on even just looking at behavioral patterns and, and, and how that, or beliefs even, and how that affects behaviors and all of the other things um, has now made me even start to think differently or even some of the way we approach um, looking through some of the design of the programs and, and how do we better do that. Um, but um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to, uh, th thank you very much to our four facilitators, uh, Ade, Greg, Niraj, and Sherry. Sherry had to leave on jury duty. Um, this was very short, but quite um, intensive, if I can say that, and, uh, and efficient too, and also interactive. And, um, and we appreciate everybody else who also took the time. I did mention initially that we had 190 people who, who registered for this. And in fact, as we were even on the call, I, I had a few more people asking me if there's some people who were supposed to join in who couldn't make it and we could, we could move room for that. So, Quite a lot of people are curious with this conversation and, and with this and, and I thank you for making it making our uh, our involvement and engagement in such a simple way like you say it's, it's a it's a complex it's not a one forward process uh, to it but thank you for structuring it in such a way where you gave us like the highlights uh, but then also allowed us to engage with the conversations we appreciate you very much we appreciate your time I appreciate you waking up so you have a longer day than we do because we are rounding up our days now uh, and thank you thank you to, thank you to the four of you please give our warm regards to sherry and thank you very much dr Adi, um, for everything you've done and you do for 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 us and for faith foundation and on behalf of faith foundation i'd like to also appreciate um all all the participants of the workshop who also joined us um, from across different spaces we have people doing different things from from abuja to plateau to river state um, we have people working with government, people doing, well, people working with trade groups, um, BMOs, uh, and also from the development, uh, the development sector, people working on bilateral programs and, and working and supporting our ecosystem in different ways. And we have one or two people also in media too. Um, I'm not sure we have anybody on intelligence, and so that would be <laughs> that that would be quite interesting um, to to have for for the next time. We will we will share the video with everyone. And once we get the slides to, we will share that. So thank you very much to once again, to our facilitators and to everyone who attended and, and to our chairman who also is on the call with us, Mr. Foladiela. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think I want to make a special, um, um, say thank you to Fola. Um, for that because um, several years ago, he had also mentioned that in terms of the social contract, when you think of the Ten Commandments, it's a form of social contract, which people had to embrace in order to move from a point A to a point B. And um, I think the Ten Commandments, of all the commandments, most of them have that shall not, which are the behavior you shall not, and a few of the behaviors that thou could do. So... That was from Fola. <laughs> Back to you, sorry, Denike. Yeah. Yes, okay. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much once again, everybody. And to Amaka, Oyebola, and Ahmed, who also worked behind the scenes to support us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.